satisfaction. That's a good word, isn't it? Hey, welcome to another look into the life and message of Elizabeth Elliot. She called us to live to a higher standard each day, to not be satisfied with just a little religion as a shallow substitute for giving God our best. As the series continues in the coming weeks, we'll hear from family, friends, and others, all influenced by Elizabeth's life and message. So today we wrap up our series, Power Through Weakness, and Elizabeth will talk about two of her favorite songs, Songs of Peace and Rest. Today we'll be joined by a friend of Elizabeth, Jean Hamilton, who will talk about a Titus II woman, and Rachel Johnson from the Elizabeth Elliott Foundation, working with our creative media. She'll talk about what surprised her most about Elizabeth Elliott. Right now, part five, the final part in our short Power Through Weakness series. It's called Satisfaction in Jesus. You are loved with an everlasting love. That's what the Bible says. And underneath are the everlasting arms. This is your friend, Elizabeth Elliott, concluding today five talks on power through weakness. Friendship is a wonderful gift. Someone to do what Jonathan did for David. A friend strengthens our hands in God. Are you one of those people who has lots of friends? No friends? Well, I have a letter here from a lady who says she needs a friend. And that is a common complaint. We need a friend. We don't really have one. She says, I especially desire one close friend. I've always had trouble making friends. I'm 42. Even when I get involved at the church and other Christian groups, it seems these days that no one has time for additional relationships. I battle depression constantly. I don't want to give in to this because I know I can't glorify God if I'm depressed. Most of my days seem so pointless. Well, this was my answer to her. My heart beats with yours in the desire for a close woman friend. My two closest friends are now in the state of Washington and New Jersey. There's no one anywhere near here with whom I can talk freely about the things that matter most. Not having such a friend forces me to find my whole satisfaction in the Lord himself. This is a great privilege and a needed lesson for us, don't you think? If we were to spend the time which we'd like to spend with a close friend, with Jesus instead, wouldn't our lives be the richer for it? Sometimes we think we, quote, need, unquote, a friend. If we really do we can be assured that the Lord will give us one because he has promised to supply all our needs. So this is our chance to leave it with him in perfect trust, not fretting because we lack something. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. And want, of course, means lack. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. I have everything I need. Now, there is something positive that we can do. I, like you, I wrote in my letter, do not make friends easily. Probably the reason is that we are thinking of ourselves, wondering if we really have anything worth offering to the other person, fearing rejection, telling ourselves, oh, she wouldn't want to be a friend to me. I can remember going into the lunchroom when I was maybe in the third grade or fourth grade and looking around over the whole lunchroom and thinking, is there anybody here that would be willing to let me sit with them at lunch? And I found a girl named Anita Love, and I think Anita had the same thing in her mind. And so Anita Love and I would eat our lunch together. A real problem, a real problem, pitfall, I should say, thinking of ourselves. And what's the remedy? To think of somebody else. To ask yourself, what can I do to cheer her up? Ask God specifically to lead you to someone whom you can bless by sacrificial love. 
There might be a young woman nearby who is starved for an older woman to mother her. Are you taking that command to us older women seriously? If you had a close friend with whom you could pour out your heart, would you also have time to minister to that lonely younger woman? Probably not. Give yourself unstintingly to her. Maybe God would, in his own way and time, give you the friend that you're seeking. And, surprise, she might be the one you've reached out to in the manner of Titus II. But, of course, that's up to God. It's our business simply to obey what he says we're to do. I believe that if you follow his leading in this, you will find that your days are far from pointless. No Christian should be living a pointless life. Is your husband not meeting your needs? Well, I've sometimes said laughingly, if I had all three of my husbands at the same time, they would not be able to meet my needs. No human being can meet our needs. What are our legitimate needs? Only the Lord really knows. And the Lord has promised to supply all of them, all of our needs. But we have to let him be the judge of what they are. Now, he could straighten that man out, that husband who doesn't share, but he has some other plans that he isn't explaining to you. Trust me, he says. You feel helpless, weak, needy, frustrated, lonely, perhaps in pain, emotional or physical, as the Apostle Paul was when he had that thorn, that famous thorn of Second Corinthians 12. Here the last stanza of the hymn, Loved with Everlasting Love, and the fourth stanza says, His forever, only His, who the Lord and me shall part. Ah, with what a rest of bliss Christ can fill a loving heart. Heaven and earth may fade and flee, firstborn light in gloom decline. But while God and I shall be, I am His, and He is mine. Would you like a spiritual exercise for growth in humility? Someone has given the answer. Live with reality and be thankful. Live with reality, that is, with your particular set of circumstances, your weaknesses, your difficulties. Live with it and be thankful. That's a great spiritual exercise for growth in humility. 1 Timothy 6.15 is translated in one of the more modern translations, speaking of Jesus Christ, that he is the blessed controller of all things. And those of you who only want the King James, I think if you looked up the King James Version of 1 Timothy 6.15, you would agree that the implication there is that he is indeed the blessed controller of all things. Psalm 138.8 says, The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. Now suppose that St. Paul had kept hammering on God's door about that thorn he was suffering from. Instead of saying, most gladly, therefore, will I glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Most gladly, therefore, will I glory in my infirmities. I can hear a voice plaintively asking, but Elizabeth, are you saying it's wrong to ask? Paul was not scolded for asking, but his ear was open to the still, small voice. His relationship with God was intimate enough. He trusted his Heavenly Father enough to believe that he had been heard. And after the third time, he knew it was time simply to receive the thorn, to accept it gladly, in the confidence that God's purpose was a far higher one than he had imagined. Here's a passage from one of my favorite books. The false love is not only expressed in a self-willed choice of evil in defiance of the law of God. Detachment means much more than that. There is a second sort of choice, not of evil as against good, 
but of a thing good in itself as against what is God's will for you at any given moment. You may say there is nothing wrong in this action, this interest, this possession, in itself, and you may be right, but it may not be God's will for you. We ought not to make ourselves the arbiters of good and evil. In these, too, there is the same essential sin, for it is still the human judgment which is being deified, the divine which is denied. Sometimes this problem will present itself in terms of an unbearable tension between the claims of a true human love and obedience to God, all one's instincts and feelings all one's judgment and deep desire for another's good, will rise up and cry out, I cannot do this, I cannot cause all this suffering and all this harm for the sake of a principle. And then you have to try to remember that in fact we just do not know with any certainty what, on the long view, is for another's good. We just cannot foresee the consequences of our actions. We just do not understand the depths of the problem of suffering. And the only thing we can do, if we want to be wise, is to trust in the judgments of God. I think that touches all of us who are mothers and grandmothers. We think we know what's best for our children, and we pray to that end. But we don't always know, do we? Of course, when my grandson went to South America, I was thinking of all sorts of possible disasters that could happen to him. I prayed that God would keep him safe. And I told you the other day that God allowed this boy, Walter, who's now 19 years old, to be robbed, not just once, but twice. Why would God allow this? That is not my problem. We do not understand the depths of the problem of suffering. And the only thing we can do if we want to be wise is to trust in the judgments of God. And God's Word tells us power comes to its full strength in weakness. Power through weakness, number five. That was satisfaction in Jesus. A little bit later, we'll hear from Rachel Johnson with the Elizabeth Elliott Foundation. Right now, it's one of Elizabeth's friends, Jean Hamilton. She'll talk about what it was like to be around Elizabeth. I had somebody from my church who was an older lady that I actually spent, physically spent time with once a week, and, and she taught me how to pray consistently. But with Elizabeth, it was, you know, of course, from a distance, but she was definitely one of my tightest two women. Mm-hmm. And it was a joy getting to be with her. I, I just think about the times I was in her home and when she would play the piano and we'd sing hymns and and um, just, you know, it was just a blessing to get to be with her. And then when she was in my home one time, I mean, you know, she was just, you know, she was just pleasant to be around. <laughs> a longtime Charleston friend of Lars and Elizabeth, that was Jean Hamilton. But we have time now to think of a couple well-known hymns that deal with peace. Maybe this has been a rough season for you. Well, maybe the discussion of these two songs will help you as you seek rest. I'm so grateful for a family in which we sang hymns. And I would urge you, parents, to teach your children hymns. And you who did not have that kind of a background, get busy right now and start learning hymns. Get a hymn book and keep it along with your Bible so that when you have your quiet time, you can read through these hymns and make them your own prayers. It's amazing how many of the great hymns of the church are in the form of prayers. And they will be very helpful when you have trouble, as I often do, in putting into words just what it is that I want to say to God. And these hymns raise our sights, too. We need to be called higher, don't we? We always need to be pressing on toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. We want to die climbing, as Amy Carmichael said, not to sort of rot or rust out or flake out or space out, but to continue to press higher and higher 
to higher ground. So the hymn that I want to give you today, some of you will know why it has had such great significance in my own life. It's another hymn to the tune of Finlandia. This one is We Rest on Thee by Edith G. Cherry. Here are the words. We rest on thee, our shield and our defender. We go not forth alone against the foe, strong in thy strength, safe in thy keeping tender, we rest on thee, and in thy name we go. Do you know why that hymn means so much to me? Well, my husband Jim Elliott and four other missionaries were making an attempt to take the gospel to unreached territory, the area in which the Auca Indians, A-U-C-A, of eastern Ecuador were living. We knew next to nothing about these people except that they were Stone Age people and they wore no clothes and they killed strangers. We certainly knew that they had never received the gospel. And so after dropping gifts for 15 weeks from a small airplane, the men felt that God's time had come for them to make an attempt to move into Alca territory and meet these people face to face. On the eve of their departure, they met together for their last prayer and planning session. And they sang this hymn, We Rest on Thee, Our Shield and Our Defender. The second stanza says, We go in faith, our own great weakness feeling, and needing more each day thy grace to know. Yet from our hearts a song of triumph pealing, we rest on thee, and in thy name we go. Yea, in thy name, O Captain of salvation, in thy dear name, all other names above, Jesus, our righteousness, our sure foundation, our King of glory, and our Prince of love. We rest on thee, our shield and our defender. Thine is the battle. Thine shall be the praise when passing through the gates of pearly splendor. We rest with thee through endless days. Most of you know the story that those five men, although they had a very friendly contact with the Alki Indians on the following Friday, they had gone in on a Monday, and Friday they had a very friendly contact with three Alka Indians. But on Sunday, they were all speared to death. Think about those words. We rest on thee, our shield. And the God who had taught these men to trust him as their shield and defender had allowed them to be speared to death. We widows thought a lot about those words. We had to face that black abyss of mystery and ask ourselves, who is this God that we trust? Where does our faith rest? I think you can understand why I emphasize constantly that our faith must rest in the character of God not in an outcome. If our faith had been pinned entirely on God's bringing those people back alive, which certainly was our prayer, then when they were spared to death, our faith would have collapsed. My faith rests in who God is. He proved his love on the cross. What else do we need to know? What more can he say than to you he hath said? to you who for refuge to Jesus have fled. There is no other refuge. And so, in the face of mystery, I continue to rest on him. And another hymn, which is in the same genre, is one that was written by a man named Horatio Spafford. And the words are, It is well with my soul. This is the first stanza. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. 
when Mr. Spafford was a very wealthy and successful lawyer in Chicago, he believed that God was calling him and his family to move to Jerusalem as missionaries. He sent his wife, and I believe it was four children, ahead on a steamer, and he was to follow. The steamer sank, and Horatio Spafford received this cablegram from his wife, saved alone. He knew that that meant that she alone of his family was rescued. Four children were drowned. Now let me read those words again. When peace, like a river, attendeth my way, when sorrows, like sea billows, roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say it is well, it is well with my soul. Though Satan should buffet, though trials should come, let this blessed assurance control that Christ has regarded my helpless estate and hath shed his own blood for my soul. My sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought, my sin, not in part but the whole, is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. And Lord, haste the day when the faith shall be sight, the clouds be rolled back as a scroll. The trump shall resound and the Lord shall descend, even so it is well with my soul. This is the hymn that we five widows and the rest of the group that had come to the memorial service sang after the five men were killed. And Cornell Kappa, the life photographer who was there at the time, had never met Christians before. He didn't know what missionaries were. He could not fathom what it was that these five men had gone into the jungle for. He stood there behind the piano very quietly with his camera and kind of shook his head at these women that could sing a song like that. In 1967, I was in Jerusalem staying in the American Colony Hotel, which was run by a son or a grandson of this Horatio Spafford. I believe his name was Horatio Spafford, Jr. And lo and behold, his mother, I believe it was his, his mother that was still there, and she, obviously it couldn't have been the son of this hymn writer, it must have been the grandson, because I was able to have tea with his mother, and she told me that she was the child of Horatio Spafford who had been born after the sinking of that ship. All the children were lost when the ship sank, but after that, when they got to Jerusalem, then this lady was born to that same family. And she told me how her mother had recounted to her the story of the sinking of that ship, and how as they were flung into the water, the mother was able to dive just deep enough to reach her fingertips out and touch the hem of the little dress on one of her children as that child slipped down below her grasp. Can you imagine the agony of a mother in a situation like that? If you've ever known anything that even comes close to that kind of sorrow, can you say, it is well, it is well with my soul? Though Satan should buffet, and he knows how to buffet us, doesn't he? Though trials should come, let this blessed assurance control that Christ has regarded my helpless estate and hath shed his own blood for my soul. And the chorus is just the repeat of those simple words, it is well with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. May you be able, in all honesty, to say those words. God bless you. Elizabeth Elliot with Gateway to Joy, number 54. We rest on thee, and it is well. Well, before we go, let's hear from Rachel Johnson, Creative Media Director for the Elizabeth Elliot Foundation. Uh, Rachel, what surprised you most about Elizabeth? I think the thing that surprised me, um, and... I've kind of learned this and discovered this just through working with the foundation and 
listening to her talks, but reading her books and getting to know, you know, her daughter, learning her story more, that she was actually very introverted. And you would think that someone with such a dynamic speaking voice and ministry where she was out, you know, in the public eye so much during her ministry, um, she was a quiet soul. Like she enjoyed quiet mornings at home. She enjoyed tea, you know, by her picture window and she loved being still and quiet. And I just think that's such a great contrast to how we tend to view Elizabeth, that she must have been this extroverted dynamic person that was, you know, loved being around all the people, but but really it was the simple, quiet, still moments that I think really recharged and fueled her that time with the Lord um, and just those peaceful, peaceful moments. Creative Media Director for the Elizabeth Elliott Foundation, Rachel Johnson. Well, our time is coming to an end. Just a little bit of time left for me to thank you for letting us join you. Maybe as you took a jog, maybe uh, in the home or office, wherever we found you. And on behalf of the Elizabeth Elliott Foundation, in cooperation with the Bible Broadcasting Network, let me invite you to check out elizabethelliott.org. For more talks, devotionals, videos, and more, elizabethelliot.org. And if you get a chance, leave us a review. Thanks. Well, until next time, may God remind you daily, you're loved with an everlasting love. Underneath are the everlasting arms. <laughs>